you might have seen this type of hash. This is using password-based key derivation function. In this video, we will have an introductory knowledge about PBKDF and how to attack it. At its core, PBKDF is a pseudo-random function. This can be an HMAC SHA-256 or 512. It accepts two inputs, the password and the salt. The initial form of password is in plain text, but it will be converted into hex representation before sending to the function. Same thing with salt. It will also be converted into hex or bytes object. The output of the one-way hash function is a unique key, but this alone is not enough as it will be easy for attackers to recover the plain text. To make it hard for attackers, we need to make it more complicated than that by chaining several functions. It starts by doing the same thing we saw from previous slide, which is to send the password and salt to a pseudo-random function. The password is in plain text and will be converted to hex representation, but the salt is different now. It will now be the combination of the salt and the encoded big Indian representation of integer 1. We'll see more later why we do it in this way. At the bottom, we see here an X or function. The purpose of this is to apply it against two inputs, which is the output of the current and previous function. But in this case, we don't have a previous function, so the value of this will be just the output of the current function. We do the same for the next function. One of the input will be the password. Then the salt value will be the output of the previous pseudo random function. Next is to perform the X or operation. We have now two inputs here, the output of the current function and the one from the previous. We repeat same process until the end. Then we produce a fixed length key. You also notice that the key is just the X or result from the previous X or operations from all functions. The number of times we perform the pseudo random function is called the iteration count. In this example, we ran it three times. The current operation produced a key, which is just a subset of the final key that will be derived later. This set of operations is valid for the entire first block. This is also the number that we concatenate with the salt during start of operation. We repeat this entire operation all over again until we achieve the target key length. In this example, we have performed five iterations over two blocks to produce a key with target length. The diagram we saw from the presentation is just a simplistic view to demonstrate how PBKDF works. In real-world scenario, we need a high iteration count, but it still depends on the system as there should be a balance between performance and security. For example, if you have too many iterations in a user login form, the system will consume more time verifying their password ending up with frustrated users since they will wait too long to log in. Cracking a PBKDF hash can be done with offline cracking tools. Let's try here an example hash from a hack-the-box machine called Titanic. In that challenge, I was able to recover the password hashes from an SQLite database file. We see here the algorithm, which is PBKDF2. The iteration count is 50,000, and the target key length is 50 bytes. We need to convert this into hashcat format using this script. We pass the salt together with the derived key. Hashcat put some identifier at the start, and it performed base 64 operations on the inputs. After that, we crack it using hashcat mode 10,900 and use Rocku as the word list. This is an easy challenge, so the password is crackable. PBKDF2 is still widely used, but do note that this is still susceptible to GPU attacks as we just saw a while ago from Hashcat. Better alternatives would be Argon, which is very resistant to memory-based attacks. I hope you learned something today. If you find my content valuable, please support me by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. See you on the next one.